Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to today's Melbourne Press Club event, Walkley Award-winning author, journalist, podcaster, mother, and ABC host, Lee Sales. Welcome, Lee. Corrie, thank you very much. Once we truly understand that we are not exceptional, but are instead are as vulnerable as the next person, what does that tell us about how we should live? And in the particular instance of journalists, what does it tell us about how we should do our jobs? In the course of writing Any Ordinary Day, I talked to some people who had found themselves through no fault of their own at the centre of a media storm on the day that their lives had been turned upside down. One of them was a guy named James Scott. When he was a young medical student in the 1990s, he'd gone hiking in the Himalayas and become lost for 43 days. And amazingly, he was then found alive. It was an absolutely massive story in Australia and all around the world because it was one of the greatest survival tales ever. Things went bad for James, though, in a media sense. Initially, he was bombarded to tell his story. He needed money because his family had spent a lot trying to find him, and he had injuries that meant he wasn't sure if he would ever be able to work. So he and his team did a deal with 60 Minutes. In a case like James Scott's, there's an unfortunate collision between two forces. Maximum public interest and therefore maximum media interest coincides with the peak vulnerability of the people involved. Not surprisingly, the early weeks after a traumatic event are when people are least able to talk to the media and least able to judge whether they should. In February 2009, one of the most devastating bushfires in Australian history tore through Victoria, killing 173 people on a day that became known as Black Saturday. Months afterwards, a university study found that many of the traumatised survivors who'd spoken to journalists could not even recall being interviewed. That study, carried out by the Centre for Advanced Journalism at Melbourne University, spoke to 28 journalists who'd covered the Black Saturday fires and to 27 survivors that they'd interviewed. The researchers noted that the pressures on journalists were acute and that it wasn't surprising that errors of judgment are made, inconsistencies abound, blind eyes are turned, ethical lapses occur, compromises are made, and the interests of the affected public fade into the background. They noted there was little evidence of journalists acting in bad faith, yet good intentions themselves weren't enough to guard against lapses. Even so, the research found that most victims felt their experience with journalists was generally positive and that the media did a good job. There's one important difference to note between an event like Black Saturday and a story like James Scott's. On Black Saturday, the victims vastly outnumbered the media. In James's case, it was dozens of journalists all homing in on one person. Maybe you buy some of the pressures that journalists face as an excuse for the way that we sometimes behave, and maybe you don't. Um, even if you agree with what I've said about the validity of chasing James Scott's story, you might disagree with some other things. For example, um, when I've said that I would have interviewed James in much the same way that Richard Carlton did, even though James has explicitly said how hurtful it was. The reason I think like that is because there's a stigma about paying people for their stories and I would have been keen to prove that I wasn't going soft on James just because my network had paid him. By that time, there were questions about the credibility of his survival tale, mostly unjustly, but they couldn't be ignored. I would have considered I was giving James a chance to correct the public record by asking him about that. Would I have worried about subjecting James to a fairly rigorous interview when his health was fragile? Yes, I would have, but I still would have been relatively tough justifying it on the grounds that it was his decision to strike the deal and do the interview and that the risk was therefore his. That is defensible thinking for a journalist. Is it defensible thinking for an empathetic human being? When I look back at the mistakes I've made as a reporter, including experiences that to this day make me feel ashamed, I can see that they were usually due to a failure of empathy. I've never made a deliberate effort to lie, mislead or skew. I've never actively set out to hurt somebody. Sometimes I've made errors due to carelessness, um, ignorance, haste or misspeaking, um, which is very hard to avoid 100% of the time on live television when you do it for years and years. The mistakes that niggle me the most, though, relate to questionable decisions I've made in the process of gathering material for broadcast due to the pressure of deadlines my ambition to deliver a cracking story, or my own lack of maturity and compassion. Since I've been hosting 7.30, I interview people who've been through trauma a lot, um, and I obviously did that also for Any Ordinary Day. And 
that's different to when I was a general news reporter because when you're a general news reporter on the road, you're sometimes covering like just um, neutral stories like uh, political stories or happy stories, somebody winning a major sporting event. And so trauma is part of what you're covering, but it's not all of it. Whereas the nature of my job now is I do a lot of uh, traumatic interviews with people who have been traumatised. And through writing Any Ordinary Day and talking to a lot of people and looking at some of this research, it has, I think, drastically improved the way that I interview people. One of the things I often will ask people now before we start the interview is, why are you doing this? Because once I understand which of those reasons is motivating them, I can try to ask questions that help them to feel like the process of doing the media interview has actually helped them and that um, it's making a difference and not harming them. Um, And I think as well, just being transparent about things like if you have to rush to get away at the end, explaining why um, so that people aren't left wondering. Definitely following up with people as well to check in how they're going is not only just an important human thing to do, it is also often um, a source of future stories. Um, So I do think um, as painful as it sometimes is to look at the way you operate as a journalist and to examine some of the mistakes that we make under deadline pressure and all of those kind of things, it is helpful to do it. And I think it it does make you a better journalist, but it also makes me feel better in the aftermath of when I've been involved with um, people who are suffering because I feel like their involvement with me has perhaps helped them rather than added anything to their sadness. Last night in Q&A, your predecessor, Kerry O'Brien, made an interesting point. There was a discussion about how we all going to, how will we go forward um, after this global pandemic And uh, how are we feeling? Are we feeling optimistic? And Kerry O'Brien said, yes, he said, the one thing that has not changed over thousands of years is human nature. And he said he has great faith in human nature. And I get the feeling, Lee, reading your book and the journey that you've been on with Any Ordinary Day, that you also have great faith in human nature. I do. And also, um, like, I just think of the young people that I've worked with over the years um, and... uh, you know, like millennials and, and Generation Y and Generation Z and whatnot, I think they get a bit of a rough time sometimes, um, you know, like this idea that, oh, they just, you know, want to finish up work and go to their yoga class or whatever. That has just been so far from my experience working with people under the age of 30. I've found them to be um, super smart, really engaged, um, but also I think tuned into um, the big picture and having compassion for other people and being sort of tolerant and inclusive in a way that I just don't think my generation was at that age. So that gives me a lot of hope when I see, I, I just meet so many amazing young people that that does give me hope too. And I think that the challenges that face them are really huge. And, you know, Kerry was saying last night, he was born just after the Second World War. He, he was saying he felt like his generation had had a pretty good run, really, and that he felt that for his kids and his grandkids, it was going to be harder. I feel like that too, when I look at younger people, but I do have a lot of faith in them. And I, and I hate, I hate it when I see people sort of giving younger generations a bad rap, because I think they're actually amazing. And I think they're going to have big challenges, but I feel from the ones I know, I feel heartened. And I think that, you know, they're up to it. Well, resilience is one of the key words in your book. Um, And here it is, everybody. This is the sales pitch. Go to a bookshop near you or come to my bookshop in Hawksburn. That's okay too. Lee, thank you so much for joining us today. You've provided our Zoom gang with um, such a terrific opportunity to sit and pause and listen and to contemplate because these are tough times that we're going through at the moment, particularly in Melbourne. Thank you for joining the Melbourne Press Club event. And we look forward to your next journey into the book publishing space. I can't wait to sell your next book, Lee, so get liking. <laughs> Did my publisher hit you up to say that? Because, you know, I think they want me to try to come up with an idea and I've got nothing. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe this virus will um, pitch forward a few new ideas. <laughs> Lee, thank you so much for joining us today. I've really loved our chat. Thank you very much for having me.